Hi everybody, welcome back. The fourth colligative property I'd like to discuss with you all is called osmotic pressure. And osmotic pressure is defined as the pressure required to stop osmotic flow. And let's just define osmosis. You may have learned about this in a biology course. It is the flow of solvent from a solution of lower solute concentration To one of higher solute concentration. And I always like to show a video to explain this in more detail and to give you a better visual because for me I remember as a student it was difficult to envision what osmotic pressure is all about. So let's go ahead and watch this video together. When we were kids growing up in West Texas, our winters would be cold but rarely experienced snow. But we did have ice which resulted in the roads being salted. As the salt mixes in and dissolves into water on the road, this can lead to a lower freezing point, which can help prevent the roads from icing over. And while this is great for making the roads more safe, it wasn't so great for the plants that lived right along the roadside. It often caused them to die. Now, winter can be hard for many plant species, but I'm talking about the salt affecting even some hardy plant life. This issue with salt in plants isn't limited to winter. During hurricanes near the coast, salty ocean water can be dumped in large quantities into the soil. This can eventually kill plants, including trees that had originally survived the hurricane. Why? Do plants just dislike salt that much? Well, it's actually related to a term called osmosis. When you are talking about osmosis, you are talking about the movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane, like a cell membrane. Water molecules are so small that they can travel through the cell membrane unassisted, or they can travel in larger quantities through protein channels like aquaporins. The movement of water molecules traveling across the cell membrane is passive transport, which means it does not require energy. In osmosis, water molecules travel from areas of a high concentration of water molecules to a low concentration of water molecules. But there's another way to think about water movement in osmosis. A low water concentration likely means there is a greater solute concentration. Solutes are substances like salt or sugar that can be dissolved within a solvent, like water. Water has the tendency to move to areas where there is a higher solute concentration, which would mean less water concentration. So if you want to easily figure out where the water will travel in osmosis, look to the side where there is a greater solute concentration. Unless we bring in another variable, like pressure, water will generally have a net movement to the area of higher solute concentration. So let's bring out a U-tube. <laughs> U-tube, that's funny. There's a semi-permeable membrane in the middle of it. Let's assume that it is similar to a cell membrane and that water molecules can squeeze through it. The molecules are quite small, but salt can't. Right now, there's just water in this U-tube. The water levels on side A and side B are equal, that doesn't mean that the water molecules aren't moving. Water molecules like to move, but the net movement across the two sides is zero. That means the overall change in direction of movement is zero. Now let's imagine on side B, you dump a huge amount of salt there. So which direction will the water initially move towards? A or B? Think about what we mentioned with osmosis. The answer is B. Side B has a higher solute concentration than side A. Water moves to areas of higher solute concentration, which is also the area of lower water concentration. 
You will also see the water level on side B rise as the water moves to that area. You can almost think of the water as trying to equalize the concentrations, diluting side B. Once equilibrium is reached, the net movement of water across the two sides will be zero. But remember that water still likes to move and movement still occurs. Now here's some vocabulary to add in here. We call side B hypertonic. That means higher solute concentration. But we can't just say something is hypertonic without comparing it to something else. We say side B is hypertonic to side A because it has a higher solute concentration than side A. In osmosis, water moves to the hypertonic side. We say side A is hypotonic. Hypo rhymes with low, which helps me remember that it's the low solute concentration when compared to side B. Let's get a little more real life now instead of just the YouTube. As you know, water is important for your body and many processes that occur in the body. When someone gets an IV in a hospital, it might look like the fluid in the IV is just pure water, but it is certainly not pure water. That would be a disaster because of osmosis. Let's explain. Let's say hypothetically pure water was in an IV. Now an IV tube typically runs through a vein so that you have access to your bloodstream, really useful for running medication through, Blood actually consists of many different types of components, and red blood cells are a great example. So what do you think has a higher solute concentration? The hypothetical pure water in this IV tube or the red blood cells? Well, cells are not empty vessels. They contain solutes. The pure water that hypothetically is running through this IV tube has no solutes. So where does the water go? It goes to the area of higher solute concentration, which in this case, is inside the cells. The cells are hypertonic compared to the pure water in the IV tube because the cells have a greater solute concentration. The cells would swell and possibly burst. Exploding red blood cells are not good. If a person needs fluids, they typically will receive a solution that is isotonic to their blood plasma. Isotonic means equal concentration. So you won't have any swelling or shrinking red blood cells. Another example, let's talk about the aquarium. I have always wanted a saltwater fish tank ever since I was a little kid, but I've only had freshwater tanks so far. I did often question when I was a kid, why is it that a saltwater fish can't be in a freshwater tank? Well, let me explain one reason why this would be dangerous to the saltwater fish and how it relates to osmosis. First ask, where is the higher solute concentration? In the saltwater fish cells or in the freshwater that the fish would be hypothetically placed in? Definitely in the saltwater fish cells. So where would the water go? It goes to the area where there's a higher solute concentration, the hypertonic side. So it goes into the cells of that poor saltwater fish. If not rescued, it could die. Now, one thing to clarify, saltwater fish and freshwater fish are not necessarily isotonic to their surroundings, but they have special adaptations that allow them to live in their environment and usually cannot make a major switch from a saltwater environment to a freshwater one. Now, not all fish have this problem. There are some fish that have this amazing adaptation to switch between fresh and salt water, and they have to deal with this osmosis problem. Salmon, for example, I think if I could pick to be a fish, I'd be a salmon. Osmosis explains how many kinds of plants get their water. Sure, many plants have roots, but how does the water get into the roots? When it rains, the soil becomes saturated with water. The root hair cells generally have a higher concentration of solutes within them than the solute concentration in the saturated soil. The water travels into the root hair cells as the root hair cells are hypertonic compared to the hypotonic soil. By the way, you may wonder, well, why don't those root hair cells burst with all the water that's going in them? That brings us to our next osmosis topic and why plant cell walls are amazing. So let's bring in another variable that can influence osmosis, pressure potential. This is when it's very useful to understand how one can calculate water potential. Water potential considers both solute potential and pressure potential. In osmosis, water travels to areas of lower water potential. So the formula is water potential is equal to the pressure potential plus the solute potential. Adding solute actually causes the solute potential to have a negative value and the overall water potential to lower. Water will travel to areas of lower water potential, but exerting pressure can raise the pressure potential, a positive value, therefore raising the total water potential. 
So let's give a quick example. In the popular water potential and potato cores lab, all kinds of neat variations of this lab procedure exist online, you can calculate the water potential in potato cores using the water potential formula. When a potato core is first put into distilled water, that's pure water, the potato core cells start to gain water. You'd expect that the water is moving towards the higher solute concentration. Thanks to their higher solute concentration, they have a lower solute potential. That means a lower total water potential than the surroundings, and water travels to areas of lower water potential. But over time, as the potato core cells gain water, the water that has entered exerts pressure against the plant cell walls from inside the plant cells, therefore raising the overall water potential in the potato core cells. We want to point out that this turgor pressure that results in plant cells, thanks to osmosis and plant cell walls, is critical for overall plant structure and the ability of plants to grow upright and not wilt. Turgor pressure is definitely something to explore. In summary, where would living organisms be without osmosis? After all, it involves movement of one of our very valuable resources, water. Well, that's it for the Amoeba Sisters, and we remind you to stay curious. So I hope you all enjoyed that video. I always love watching their videos, the Amoeba Sisters. They're pretty funny, but um, also you learn a lot um, of biology with them. All right, so just to give you another visual that um, comes from your textbook um, is the YouTube that they also referred to, right? Remember that there's a semi-permeable membrane right here and that selectively allows some substances to pass through but not others. And so in this case, only water molecules, those are these guys here, the red oxygen and two hydrogens, and then the solute particles are the blue spheres. And so the water molecules are moving back and forth. And we learned from this video that water flows from lower concentration To higher concentration of the solute. And so we see in this figure here that on the left side of this YouTube we have solute particles, so it's concentrated. On the right side is pure water, and so that water is going to travel more so on this side. You see it going back and forth, but more water will travel on this side from lower concentration to higher concentration. And the pressure of the excess fluid is what is measured as the osmotic pressure of that solution. So for example, if external pressure is applied to the solution, That is rising on the concentrated side. In this case, it was on the left side. Then the osmotic flow can be stopped and that is called osmotic pressure. Which is represented by pi. And the formula for you to learn here 
and to utilize is that osmotic pressure, like the other colligative properties, um, is affected by the number of particles, so don't forget I. The concentration, though, is actually in molarity, not molality here. So capital M stands for molarity. And molarity, remember, is moles of solute over liters of solution. R is the ideal gas constant, 0 0.08206 liters, atmospheres, moles, Kelvin. Temperature has to be in Kelvin then. And like I just said, I is number of particles. If you have a covalent molecule, then I is one, but if you have something that's ionic and it does dissociate in water, it has to be soluble in water, right? Um, if it dissociates in water, then you have to count the number of ions formed on the product side. And that's how you would calculate osmotic pressure. The final units of osmotic pressure, because we're using the ideal gas constant here, would be in atmospheres. And then you could always convert to torr using a conversion factor. Um, there's 760 torr for every one atmosphere. All right. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.